Matt, Chris and Maggie, thank you so much for being here. Now, Matt and Chris, I think we should just explain how you two work together. So IBM is the digital partner of Wimbledon, which is why we have the two of you on stage together, just so there's no surprises. Um, Chris, I want to start with you first. So AI is being used in various ways at Wimbledon. Could you maybe highlight a couple of the cases that you think have been most transformative to date? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, like you said, there's a, there's a number of ways that we've been utilizing AI. Um, I think the first one is around distilling data and being able to deliver engaging fan experiences at the back of that. Now, when I talk about that, it all starts with the fan, understanding their needs, understanding the pain points and understanding what we can serve them to get them more engaged with Wimbledon mm -hmm. and get them more engaged with the tennis. So what we've done over the years um, is we've done a number of different initiatives, starting with our power index, so what this was was a dynamic uh, index which enabled, uh, it enabled users to be able to see how players are progressing in terms of their form as you moved on through the tournament. So something a lot more dynamic than existing rankings. So users could understand exactly who they should be looking out for in terms of the big matches that are coming out. Mm -hmm. That then fed through to uh, our match insights which are a percentage likelihood to win um, for each player uh, in a, on a match that's coming up. Um, so, you know, for, for a fan, they can see where the big matches are, who's likely to play, especially for those, those fans that are perhaps less engaged, that don't follow the tour year round. And where are they consuming this? On... So that's on our digital platforms digital as well platforms. as on social media. Okay. And then this year, um, or in 2023, uh, we uh, took that a step further with our draw analysis. So what that was was an analysis of how difficult or favourable a player's draw was from the very start. So that enabled a user to be able to select a player and see what their path through the to the final looked like. Mm -hmm. um, so they could see where the big matchups were coming, where they were going to have a slightly more challenging matchup, mm -hmm. uh, and then they could see that in order to, to be able to fully understand how the draw was likely to, to play out. And Matt, who is the demographic that you're targeting here? Because it doesn't seem like if I think about, you know, my parents who love Wimbledon, I can't imagine they're going to be tuning into the app to, to engage with all this data. Yeah, so, so I think it's aimed at all demographics. So, you know, only a small number of people get to experience physically the Wimbledon, the amazing Wimbledon environment each year. Mm -hmm. So this is all about extending the reach, the richness of the brand. Um, you know, and just the beauty um, of the game and sport. And so that second screen experience that people can access through the iPad app, iOS, Android, through the web platforms acts as an amazing companion effectively to the live broadcast. Um, and so, you know, we end up with all types of demographics accessing that um, in order to drive a deeper level of engagement with the game and with the sport. Maggie, I'm going to come to you in one second. Bearing all of this in mind, as we integrate AI further into the viewing experience, does what it mean to be a sports fan change? So um, does what it mean? No, I, don't, I don't think it does. I think it allows us to actually make the most of people's time. And I think if we all think about us in the room, everybody's chosen to spend time here today. All right? And time is probably the most valuable commodity that we've got. And so if we're able to create experiences that allow people to personalize the use of that time and be able to access the information that they want, you know, and certainly being able to create, you know, personalized content, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think the technology provides an amazing way to make the most of people's time. Matt, so in addition to working with Wimbledon, IBM works with Seville Football Club, with the Golf Masters, with the US Open. Um, I have a question about how you decide what use cases to pursue. So I saw a clip on Twitter or X of what was AI enabled commentary at the Golf Masters. And some people were loving it and some people were saying, if this is what it sounds like, I'm pressing mute. How do you make sure that viewers want the new technologies that you're introducing and that it's not just innovation for innovation's yeah. sake? Yeah, so I mean, we've just obviously Masters concluded yesterday. I did. Um, been partner with them, I think for over 25 years now. And so uh, this year we had um, uh, spoken voice commentary for every shot, for every hole, for every player. Um, in both English and Spanish. And so the key objective there, and also similarly, if you look at what we're doing with Wimbledon and the US Open, is to basically be more inclusive. And so if we can provide effectively the ability for you know, people in their natural language to be able to access deep and rich commentary around the game that they're watching, um, you know, uh, we've done similarly with um, Wimbledon around the highlight clips um, and the highlight reels that we generated last year and layering a natural language spoken voice commentary. Uh, Will generated. it ever sound full of emotion and excited yeah. about the game? Yeah, no. So, so I think there's a lot of work that we've done taking open source large language models mm -hmm. and a small model and training it specifically and not just on language because this isn't a language mm -hmm. translation issue. No. 
Um, this is around picking up the nuances of the game and expressing effectively what people are seeing in the way in which it's going to build emotion. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly, we've started with English and Spanish as two of the big constituents um, of viewing groups, but we absolutely see this as something that will open up to other languages beyond. But I think, I think it's important to say that actually what, what you're not aiming to do here is replace the human commentators. Yeah. Actually, what we're looking to do is find ways to supplement them. So, so, so for instance, a highlights clip. The highlights cl clips at Wimbledon last year, um, we had generative AI commentary that was overlaid onto them. What that was offering was context as to the clip that you were watching. So it's not about trying to bring out that human emotion. It's not John McEnroe screaming at how exciting the point is. What it is is just providing that extra little bit of context, which enables you to understand what you're seeing and why it's important. Okay. And so, so it's, it's, around, it's about finding the right use case for it. It's not necessarily about you know, replacing or, or, or trying, to, or trying to, to, to come up and shoehorn these into to places where they're not necessarily needed. Mm -hmm. It's about finding where the gaps are in the fan experience. Mm -hmm. And then we can look at the technology and whether or not the technology can work to alleviate, alleviate some, of those, some of those challenges that fans are having. And, oh, whoop, sorry. I was going to say, and this point of augmentation is really important because... Yeah, and I think if I look at the, the video generated highlight clips um, that we produce, you know, that's not to replace content producers, but it's effectively to allow the AI to take a decision looking at crowd noise and player facial gestures and fist bumps to auto curate what, what you know, we believe is the most exciting points of the game and then allowing a content editor to push that highlight reel and reduce the cycle time for getting stuff out there basically and allow more content and a quicker cycle time. And Chris, Wimbledon's a very unique example because it's a tournament that's so steeped in heritage. And so the balance between preserving that culture and innovation is a particularly unique one. Um, I know that the ATP has announced that it's going to be using electronic line judges across its tour as of next year, I think. Wimbledon obviously um, has in-person line judges. And I wonder, has using AI to make judgment calls on court been discussed for the future of Wimbledon? So for, for this year, we are we're planning on, on keeping uh, human line judges. Um, obviously, with any new and emerging technology, we'll be looking at how that progresses. We work very closely with the other tennis bodies and we'll be learning from their experience. But our decision will be down to, to what we think provides the best experience, both for players and, and for fans. So it could be in the future. <laughs> no comment. OK, <laughs> Maggie, um, aside from hope, how else can AI be used to bring more diversity to the game? Oh, well, it's funny. I was thinking about um, how AI could be used in, in general. I mean, I run a fan-owned club. You know, we have 2,400, 2,500 owners in 41 different countries. And I think, you know, we're, we're all very aware uh, as non-AI specialists about targeting and segmenting your audiences. But it does make me think, how about if we were able to segment to the point that rather than getting a monthly or a, or a weekly newsletter, you were actually getting a video from me. So I was telling that person exactly what they want to hear because we're able to understand exactly what they want so that they're actually getting a, a, a video in their inbox where I'm saying, hey, hey, Dave, how are you doing? You saw the results last week. And it, it, it actually could personalize the experience. The real challenge in all of this is football's about people. It's about that human connection. And I would worry that you would uh, lose some of the value of me actually writing an email to somebody if they are receiving a monthly video from me that, that gives them what they know they want to hear, but it's not actually me saying it. So I think that's the thing that we have to, to, to toe the line on a little mm -hmm. bit. Mm -hmm. um, Matt, I'm going to ask you the next question, then we're going to open it up to the floor. So get ready if you have anything to ask. Um, I'm interested in IBM's partnership with Sevilla FC. Mm -hmm. um, and specifically, I know that similarly to what we heard Dr. Beale talking about, the use of AI to enhance scouting, yep. a challenge there is privacy and the sharing of personal biometric data that belongs to players. What kind of guardrails or regulations do you have in mind when you're thinking about, about that particular use? Yeah, so, so I guess for, for all of the work that we do in this space, so we have a platform that we've built in IBM called our What's Next, which is our generative AI technology. As part of that, there's a governance platform and, and toolkit. And so where we put these models into use, um, that governance toolkit allows you the ability to monitor, manage for bias, drift, um, explainability, um, observability and live use. You think about all of the regulation that's coming in around the world and making sure that you're compliant with all of that. Um, and so certainly if I look at the work we're doing with Sevilla Football Club, um, so this is a, a, a product that we built for them called Scout Advisor. It's powered by uh, our AI platform. 
um, and basically taking a lot of the quant and qual data that they've got around kind of potential players, about 200,000 player reports that they have, and basically producing a very simple digital product to allow their 20 plus scouts that they've got to be able to access that information, to get simple summaries of that information and the data that's there to help them take better decisions. So again, it's not to replace them, mm -hmm. but it's basically to help them sift through the huge volumes of data that they've got. I mean, these models are amazing at summarizing, at being able to kind of chat with information, at being able to classify information. Mm -hmm. And so when you think about generative AI, there's many uses of it in a non-generative way. Mm -hmm. And so you know, using, using this, this type of technology to basically help get these insights and gems from the data there to allow them to find talent. Does anyone have any questions for the panel? Yes, we've got one right here at the front. Please tell us your name and your company. Yes, hello, Jamie T. Van from Microsoft. A uh, few years ago, I went to the League of Legends World Championship and the sport my children watch most is Fortnite. Um, this seems like there's a lot of opportunity for AI, particularly in the esports domain. I was wondering if you could say anything about that. Well, yeah, uh, so uh, actually, funny enough, uh, Wimbledon entered Fortnite um, last year um, with uh, Race to Wimbledon, which was a mini game, uh, which we launched on, on Fortnite last year. Um, I think um, there's definitely a, a lot of potential in that esports domain. It's very interesting because what we're trying to, uh, to, to match up is uh, as Ellie mentioned before, our heritage and you know the fact that Wimbledon is a brand that people know and they associate with certain things, with the fact that we're trying to, to move forwards and we're trying to deliver more engaging experiences through a variety of different ways and means. And at the centre of all of that is the human element of it, is the fact that you know the, the remarkable feats of sports people are remarkable because they are human. And you can't quite believe it at times, but they are. In the esports domain, potentially there is a little bit more leeway to be able to be a bit more expansive in some of that. Um, and I think it's maybe something that sits a little bit more, more, more naturally there. Um, I just want to finish with a quick fire question for each of you. Um, so we're obviously in a room of people who largely work in the business world. What lessons from the application of AI in sport, in your experience, would you like everyone here today to take to their respective sectors? Maggie, let's start with you. I mean, number one, for us, when we were designing Hope, you had to have proper human input. So even though the brilliant uh, creative agency Dark Horses were the ones that put it together, they needed me and they needed my, data, my database of incredible women to be able to feed it in. And if we are not being diverse in the way that we uh, create AI, we're going to lose out a lot of opportunities, but also sideline a lot of people as well. Yeah, I think it's, it's about being led by your users and your customers, not being led by the technology and also knowing the limitations of the technology. So in our instance, for instance, we, we work specifically with Watson X, which is the IBM platform, because it can be specifically trained in our domain. So we can guarantee the quality of the outputs. It's going to talk like you would expect Wimbledon to talk, for instance. So definitely be led by your users and know the limitations of the technology. And then I think, um, look, I, I guess a lot of the conversation around AI and generative AI at the moment is on productivity, mm -hmm. right? And people looking at how this technology can be used to drive productivity and processes within the enterprise. So HR and procurement, supply chain, customer service, and it absolutely can, and it's absolutely going to have a profound impact in, in those areas of business. But I think what the sports world demonstrates um, it, 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 you know, in, in, in spades is the use of this technology to drive um, new types of products and services and a deeper engagement with your customers and fans. And so I think there's a lot that business, every industry can learn about the way in which the sports industry drives really deep personalized engagement um, through using AI data and analytics. Matt, Chris, Maggie, thank you so much for joining us today.